when when uh, when Alyssa was saying, uh, "Are you ready?" I was like, "I'm uh, now. I'm ready. I feel uh, I feel excited." Sorry, S- sorry, Georgie. I um switched the mics. And I double switched. I'm so sorry. But uh, when when Alyssa was just saying, "Are you ready?" I'm like, going, "Whoa! Now now I'm ready to preach." And uh, it's an exciting time to be in church. Um, so so many things I could say. Firstly, uh, Essendon won yesterday. Very happy about that. Uh, always good beating the Tigers by one point. Thank you, Fred, as a party. Uh, I'm so sorry. I should no, not mention people. But, you know, this week, uh, the church actually went to the movies and we saw Jesus Revolution. And it was an incredible time together. I would encourage you, if you have not seen this movie, to go see it. Uh, it, it, it will literally stir you. Uh, and I, I can just tell a quick story. I hope it's okay. I have not asked any permissions. But a few weeks ago, uh, one of our people from Alpha, Cindy, who's actually sitting uh, just here uh, to my right, she went to go see this movie. And this young gentleman is just sitting there after this movie, and she felt led and struck up a conversation and ends up having a conversation, with, and she leads him to Jesus. Then she invites him to Alpha comes to Alpha. The week after, she, he brings a friend to Alpha. And all of a sudden, and I'm just believing that God is going to use this movie to impact lives. Can I get an amen? As in, and so here's the thing, is that God will just not speak to you and use you in a church service. He'll speak to you in the car park, and he'll use you in the car park. He will speak to you at your schools and in your universities and in your uh, places of employment, and he'll use you there too. And I want to encourage you to embrace heaven on earth, is to actually apply this not just on a Sunday morning for 90 minutes, but to embrace it in every area of our lives. Everyone say "Heaven heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Prince or Joel Paul. No, I'm just joking. It's Prince. The the kid, the... The brothers, are, we, we're talking about it. Let's get straight into the word this morning. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. We're going to read about 15 passages of Scripture this morning, um, 15 verses, and then we'll, maybe 15 passages all up. I'm not sure. But uh, are you guys ready to hear the word? Yeah. I'm just, this side sounds very ready, unsure. Are you guys ready to hear the word? Yeah. Fantastic. Let's do it. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 21. This is what it says. When they returned to the other disciples, three disciples and Jesus went on a seven-day trip, and they had a heavenly experience. So when they returned, the heavenly experience was Jesus literally talking to Moses and Elijah. It's a heavenly encounter. They hear the audible voice of God, right? And literally, the audible voice of God says this. It says, this is my son. Listen to him. It's an amazing encounter. But they returned from a heavenly encounter encounter conference to they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some of the teachers were uh, teachers of the law were arguing with them so they come from heaven back down to earth and when they saw when when the crowd saw Jesus they were overwhelmed with awe everyone say awe they were overwhelmed with awe and they greeted him what is all this arguing about Jesus said one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said teacher I brought my son so you could heal him. I had a problem. I had a situation. I had a circumstance that I couldn't find a solution for. So I brought him to you to heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, he throws him to a violent, uh, into a violent compulsion. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth. He becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast him out. I asked them to cast him out. But they couldn't do it. That's, a, that's, a, that's not a nice prayer meeting to go to. You know when you, you've, taken like, you've taken that need and you don't automatically get that response that you want. So then Jesus responds and says, you faithless people, you doubtful people, you unbelieving people, how long must I be there with you? How long must I put up with you? He says, bring the boy to me. Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it went into another uh, uh, convulsion, a violent convulsion. So the the situation escalates, and all of a sudden, Jesus, in his calmness, in his coolness, he's not going, well, we better deal with this straight away. He actually turns to the dad, and he says, well, how long has this actually been happening for? Let me tell you, there is no circumstance that you can bring to God that will overwhelm him. 
There is nothing that you can ever bring to him that will ever go, oh my, this is too much. He, he is always on time. He, all, he is always calm about the situation that we're going through. How long has this been happening for? He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us if you can. Help us if you can. Everyone say, if you can. If you can. What do you mean, Jesus says, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. Anything is possible if a person believes. Anything is possible if a person believes. And the, this father instantly replies with this perfect response, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I, I do trust in you. I do believe what you're saying, but would you help me overcome like, my doubts? Will you help me? This father comes openly to Jesus with, with honesty, transparently, openly, not going, hey, I've got all the faith in the world, but he's saying, I've got faith, but I'm, but I'm scared. I've got faith and I want you to heal, but, but I'm worried, what if it doesn't happen? When Jesus saw the crowd and the onlookers, he rebuked the evil spirit. He commanded it to leave the boy and the crowd thought it, uh, the boy was dead, but Jesus helped him up and he stood up. Afterwards, when everyone left, when all the crowds left, the disciples at home said to Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer and fasting. This kind can only be cast out. This sort of faith requires an intimacy with me, a closeness to me. Today I want to speak about inviting heaven on earth. Inviting heaven on earth. Why don't you bow your heads and let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you speak to us so clearly this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that I will step out of the way for what you want to do. That, Lord, you will speak to people. That you will use us weak vessels. And, Lord, you will speak directly to the hearts of your people. You will transform lives, that you will shift thinking, and you will change hearts this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. amen. That, was a, that was a strong amen. Well done. Have you, so I've said this many times, but two specific times I've definitely said it. I've said these sorts of, sorts of things like, that will never happen. You know, like as in, that is never going to work, that will never happen. I'll tell you a moment where I thought that will never happen, it's never going to work, is a couple of years ago when they introduced 15 cent plastic bags. You, do you remember when they introduced this idea of 15 cent plastic bags? I was in Laylaw at the time, and Laylaw, Laylaw's fun, you know, like as in when you go shopping in Laylaw, it's the fruit market, everyone knows each other, everyone's feeding your kids, everyone's pinching your cheeks, it's, it's pretty cool. But I'm like walking around with Alyssa at this time when they're introducing 15 cent plastic bags, and I said to my wife, this is never going to work. Like as in there are going to be riots in Laylaw, 15 cent, that is about 147% markup on a 15, like for 15 cents on a bag, as in it's too expensive, I'm like going, this is never going to work, this will never catch on, no one in their right mind will pay 15 cents for a plastic bag. Here I am, two years later, constantly paying 15 cents, <laughs> like all the time. Like, I should have a credit card, just, go, just it's just another bag. Like, and or if you don't really want to adjust, you're holding as many products as you can in your pockets and in your bags, and you're going, please, because I don't want to pay 15 cents for that bag. Here's another thing I never thought that would happen. Do you want to know what it was? It was this three-bin situation in Watsonia. This yellow bin, this green bin, this red bin. There's a purple bin in Bandura. Like, have you guys lost your mind here? Like, what is happening? Like, honestly, though, why would you have all these bins? And I said to myself, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Like, this is silly. This is never going to work. I remember getting that little pamphlet where they told you what to do. Silly, not happening. I remember when there was just two bins, and I never even recycled shouldn't admit to that. 
just just for who else did not recycle when you were supposed to? Any just silent hands? Any sign? I'm, okay, there's just a few like, oh, okay. Every week, 30 minutes, I spend layering this green bin with food wastage and trees and cut grass leaves and branches. And here I am every week on a Thursday night, just going in the dark sometimes. And I'm putting dirt. Food. I'm so surprised how heavy food is, by the way. Uh, anyway, but uh, and then more branches and leaves and then more food. And here I am. I never thought it would take place. But here we are, paying 15 cents for bags and spending 45 minutes at our bins every week. If you're saying I'm taking too long, well, come over and help me out. Um, but I wonder when it comes to seeing heaven on earth, if we think the same about miracles and healings in God. Some of us have this attitude where we go, it's never going to happen. It will never take place. But what if I told you that in the same way, paying 15 cents for bags and lining your bins is normal, God wants to show his miracle. He wants to show his power in our lives and it's normal. What if I told you that was heaven on earth? We've accepted all these other lifestyle changes, but the reality is I want us to accept and believe today God still heals. God still speaks. God still restores. God still transforms. God is in the business of miracles. Yesterday, uh, we, had this, we heard the sad news. Um, those of you that might know this, this pastor, Timothy Keller, he actually passed away yesterday um, over the weekend. Um, but he was an incredible writer and preacher. But this is one of the quotes that he shared when it comes to healings and miracles. He says, we modern people. Everyone say, we modern people. He's talking about us. Uh, we modern people think of miracles as the suspension of the natural order. But Jesus meant them to be the restoration of the natural order. The Bible tells us that God did not originally make the world to have disease, hunger, and death. But Jesus has to redeem where it is wrong and heal the world where it is broken. His miracles are not just proofs of his power and also one foretaste of what he is going to do with that power. Jesus' miracles are not just a challenge to our minds, but they are a promise to our hearts that the world we want, heaven on earth, is coming. Heaven on earth is here today, inviting heaven. Heaven on earth. Well, where does it start? What would you need to do to invite heaven on earth? Well, it starts off by making a decision to believe. It starts off by you and I making a daily decision, an everyday decision to believe. And some of you are going, I believe. I believe. But, but I want to encourage us and challenge us this morning, but do we really show our belief? How, what does our belief look like? As we look at this passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 9, um, the, the words here say, What do you mean, if I can, Jesus said? Anything is possible if a person believes. And this father answers, honestly, I do believe. It's a decision. I do believe, but help my un." Belief. I wonder this morning, would you come to God honestly this morning? Not perfect, not with perfect faith. We have no perfect faith. But honestly this morning, I do believe, but would you help me overcome my doubts this morning? I know you've called me, God. I know you've got a plan for my life, God, but would you help me overcome the thoughts in my mind, the insecurities that I face? I know I need to take that next step with that relationship, with that career move, with which, which, whatever it might be, but would you help me push through my fear? I do believe that you say, but there's this hesitation in me. Would you minister to that hesitation? I know you heal. I know you can still do miracles, but help me pass, work past my doubts. I want to tell you this morning that God accepts us with our belief and our unbelief. And to come to God honestly is to say, God, I need you, but, but I'm scared. God, I need you. I don't know what the plans are. I don't know how this is all going to work out, but I'm going to trust you. But, but, but I have my concerns. I have my fear. 
You've got to make a decision to believe. To talk about belief, you've got to talk about doubt. If you look at this passage in Mark chapter 9, everyone was doubting. When they came from heaven to earth, what happened was the Pharisees were arguing. They were probably arguing about the fact that who's got the better theory when it comes to exorcisms? Like, how do you get rid of a demon? They, they, they probably thought they were greater teachers. So they were arguing about that. There were doubts there. There were doubts in the approach. There was doubts from the Father. It happened in his language, if you can, Jesus. And, you know, we don't automatically get there, but over time in our Christian walk, in our, in our faith journey, things can go from I believe to if you can, I hope you can, I, I think you can. The crowd, even though the child was healed, they thought he was dead. That's unbelief. That is a doubt. That is going, is this working? And then the disciples. Imagine being one of the disciples who prayed and nothing happened. Imagine the doubt and the unbelief that would be going through their minds. They, they were probably saying, I am never holding a prayer meeting again. Let's just park it and let's just stick to this, the safe space. You know, this would not be the first or the last times the disciples would actually doubt Jesus. And I can see the tension in the room taking place going, well, you've got to have faith. Like, as in just, just doubt's not okay. Unbel doubt is okay. Unbelief is okay. It's about not staying there. It's about still believing that God can. It's still about shifting our hearts to say God can still move. I want to show you this passage of Scripture. Three and a half years with the disciples Jesus spent. And Mark chapter 16, verse nine, this is what it says. It says, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, who he cast seven demons out from her. She went and told those, the disciples, who had been with them and who were mourning and weeping. So they're, they're sad. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen them, what does it say? They did not believe. They spent three and a half years with Jesus, but they did not believe. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. They returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe either. They didn't believe either. In Luke chapter 24, verses 9 to 11, it shows the same thing. Let me tell you something, and this is just to set everyone on the same track, wherever you're at. If you're in doubt, if you've got some unbelief taking place in your mind, let me tell you, you've got good company. You've got really good company. And let me tell you, Jesus still says to you, come to me. Jesus still says to you, come to me. Side note, if you're thinking right now, hey, but where's the faith in the room? Two things I would encourage you to do. Firstly, Jude chapter 1, verse 22, it says, have mercy on those who doubt. As a church family, our job is not to judge an unbelief or a doubt. It is actually to partner with. It is actually to minister to and be with. And maybe your doubts just look a little bit different, a little bit less obvious to others. But I want to encourage you to partner with those. Do not judge those that are working through doubts. We need to be like this father in this story who had doubts but chose to believe. He had his doubts, but he made a decision to believe. You might be asking, but what do I need to believe in? Like as in, the answer is not what, the answer is who. Who do I need to believe in? Well, the three things you need to believe about, about Jesus is that Jesus is God. You need to believe that Jesus is God. Jesus is not just a good guy. Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's not just a humble human being that we like and that we, you know, okay, hey, he's not bad. No, no, no. He is God. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. And he is everywhere. You know, at different points throughout the passages of Scripture, you see that Jesus sometimes alludes to being God. Like he, he kind of gives this kind of, hey, I'm kind of saying it, but I'm not. And they, they kind of dance with him on a few occasions. But in John chapter 8, verse 58, he makes it abundantly clear. He says, very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Do you know what he's saying here? Before Abraham was born 2,000 years ago, 
I'm God. I'm the one who said, let there be light. Can you imagine Jesus in front of these Pharisees? They actually, they literally wanted to stone him straight after. But he's saying, before Abraham was born, I am. He is the same I am that was in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. We need to believe that Jesus is God. The second thing that you need to believe is that Jesus loves you. Sounds like an easy one, but we need to believe that Jesus loves us. When you look at the book of John, John is always known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you kind of go, maybe that was just John's idea, but the Holy Spirit inspired these, these scriptures, he, they would, he would never allow, what was, you know, allow something that shouldn't be there. But John chapter 20, verse 2, it says, She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. Literally five or six times this takes place in John. This is what I want to say to you, is that when you have a revelation of the love of God, you'll believe. When there is a deep revelation of the relationship and a love of God, the one-to-oneness that he wants with us, you will believe. John had a revelation. John 20, verses 8 to 9, then the disciples, sorry, then the disciple who had reached, this is John, reached the tomb first, went in, he saw, and he believed. It was immediate. Why? Because he had a revelation of God. You know, when um, Alyssa says she's going to do something, for example, she says she's going to cook me an amazing meal and she's going to, you know, buy me all the clothes that I want and she's going, you said this a couple of days ago, remember? Um, <laughs> but it is out of who she is and our relationship that I trust what she's saying. When you don't have an intimacy with God, you can't trust what he's saying. When you are not close to God and there is a oneness there, there is a closeness there, how can you trust his love and how can you trust what he has planned for your life? You have to believe that Jesus loves you, that Jesus loves you. Thirdly, you have to believe that you love Jesus. Sometimes, depending on the week and maybe what you've done or what you haven't done, Maybe I don't love Jesus. Maybe, and the enemy creeps in at these points. And he will either say you do or you don't. And in these moments, you have to remind yourself that you still love Jesus. He is still committed to you and you are still committed to him. Let me tell you, Peter denied Christ three times. It was a denial of everything of who he spent time with for three and a half years, but yet Jesus saw him as a person, that a rock on who he would build the church. The thing is, is that as much as the enemy will try and seep in, I want to tell you, the enemy is a liar. You still love Jesus. You are still committed to him. He still loves you. And he's still committed to you. What do you need to believe in? You need to believe that Jesus is God, that he loves you and you love him. Hear the heart of God this morning. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again so that you and I can be saved and have relationship with the Father. I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe, but I, but, but, but please help my doubts. What a beautiful position. What a beautiful posture to have with God. I wonder if we would all be willing to have this come to Jesus moment to say, I do believe, but would you help me? Would you help me? Make a decision to believe. I'm not finishing my message, just so you know. Make a decision to believe will automatically lead to a devotion to prayer. If those of you that were listening and you were just ticking these off and you said, I, I believe in Jesus, check. I, I believe he loves me, check. I, I know, I believe, I love him. Let me tell you, it will be tested and the measurement of it is in your prayer life. Yeah. Let me just say that. it. It's tested in our prayer lives. 
If we want to see heaven on earth, prayer needs to be a priority. Not a nice idea, not held for one meeting or the other, or not for a season, but it needs to be part of us and in us. When we look at this father in Mark chapter 9, he was not going to die wondering. What did he do? He brought his son to Jesus. The disciples pray for him. And what happened? Well, nothing happened. There was no amazing miracle. There was no moment to go, whoa, like, as in finally it's happened. But what did the father do? The father didn't step away. The father didn't go to another place. The father didn't, didn't kind of just try and... Oh, kind of change his mind, but he stayed and he waited. He persisted. And I want to encourage you this morning, for those of us that maybe are waiting for a miracle, would you, would you continue to pray? Would you continue to persist? Would you continue to lean forward and lean towards God? He was desperate for a miracle. And literally what he was saying was, can we pray again? Like, can we, can we do this? Can we pray again? Can we not stop here? Because I, I, I want a healing. I need a healing. I, I believe in you, Jesus. And Jesus came and healed his son. We need to pray again. Keep coming to Jesus. And, and some of you might think, well, does that mean I don't see a doctor? And the answer is absolutely not. You must book that doctor's appointment. You definitely book that counseling appointment. You definitely get practical and professional help, but make sure you pray. Make sure you pray because we have a God that can step into any situation, any situation, and turn it around. There's this story of this um, famous revivalist, and I heard it a few weeks ago at a conference that we were at, and literally he would walk into towns and begin to minister, and, he, and people would say he would be well-known because every time that he would walk into a town and start praying for people, there'd be salvations, there'd be healings, there'd be miracles, there'd be signs, just every time. And so after a while, they, they asked this gentleman, what's the secret? Like, why do you think God uses you like this? And he says, well, a lot of people know my name, but they don't know, and he started to list off a couple of people. And it was actually a prayer group and, and a prayer person that would go into the town before him. And a couple of weeks before or a week before, he would enter the town and begin to pray in the restaurants, pray in the streets, pray all around in these areas, and they would set a platform for God to move. And a lot of us are wondering, well, why don't we see God move? Why isn't this taking place? But I wonder what kind of platform of prayer we are setting it was all in the prayer. When we begin to understand and value prayer the, and the priority of prayer, I believe our approach to many things, not just some things, but many things will change. I think a lot of us can put prayer to like, um, like the RACV. When do you use the RACV? For emergencies. You use prayer like a spare tire. Prayer is not a spare tire. It is the engine. Prayer cannot be used just when scenarios and circumstances go crazily hard and, and impossible. Yes, God deals in the impossible, but prayer should be part of us. It should be like breathing because it creates intimacy with God. It creates oneness with Him and a leaning to Him. One of the largest churches in the world is found in South Korea, in Seoul. And um, some of you would know the church and the pastor there who, who passed, but... Um, they asked the pastor, the, the church started with 30 people, okay, and he would pray like five, six hours a day. And they said, well, why do you pray? It's like for five, six hours, and they thought there was going to be some theological answer. And he goes, well, I've only got 30 people. What else am I going to do? Like as in, you know, he was kind of like going, I could pastor them, but that only takes a two days, so I've got a lot of time here, so that's what I'm doing. Do you know how many people they grew, grew, they continue to grow by and grew by in the early days per month? Not 1,000, not 5,000, but every month this church would grow by 10,000 people. That is a lot of next steps cards. Like, like that is like, like, whoa. 
10,000 people a month, this church would grow. And he puts it down to a 4.30 a.m. prayer meeting where 3,500 people rock up to commit the services, the people, and the nation to Jesus. It starts with a devotion to prayer. We have to decide. You have to make a decision today, church, everyday church, that I'm going to believe in an all-powerful God. And then it requires a devotion to prayer that oozes out of us day in and day out. You won't worry about what society is saying. You won't worry about what you're feeling and thinking, but we will just believe and pray. Pray and believe. I just want to... Honor and I just want to, yeah, honor and celebrate the, the prayer teams that are in our church here. To be honest, if you were a part of the Wednesday fortnight or the Tuesday morning or wherever it is, prayer group, would you just stand to your feet just really quickly? I know there's a few of us in the room already. Don't be shy. Come on, Bed. Come on. Would you put, come on, can we put our hands together for these people? You should be thanking them. Because they pray for these seats before you walk in. They pray for your families, for your sons, for your daughters. They pray for our leadership. They pray for the pastors and the ministries. They have been praying for you not for just a few weeks. They've been praying for you for years. And I thank God for the prayer warriors. And there are so many more that maybe aren't here today or maybe serving today that I know continually pray. You can't, I don't, well, I'll, I'll offend you. You can't delegate prayer. You can't delegate prayer to someone else. You can't delegate prayer to a prayer team meeting or a WhatsApp group that says, can you pray for me? We've got to pray. We've got to believe. We've got to believe and pray. You know, next time there is a fasting and prayer time, don't think it's just for the pastors, leaders, and people that might be a little bit crazy like them. Fasting and prayer is for you. Next time that we hold a prayer meeting, and maybe the next one's actually at 9.30 in the morning here, like as in before service, Let's make sure that we are here expecting and believing God to move. Pray and believe that God is moving. Luke 18 talks about the persistent widow. We need to be persistent in our prayers, constantly coming to him. It says that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I wonder how many sons and daughters are in the house because of the persistent prayers of a parent and grandparent. I wonder how many healings and miracles have taken place because of the weekly prayer meetings or the laying of hands or the secret place of prayer for an individual. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. You know, I heard this passage this week So many times, this Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without season, give thanks in all circumstances. Do you know what room it was in? It was in a room of a funeral. On on Thursday and and on a Wednesday night, I heard this verse, and it was was such a beautiful and and honoring service of Akumi, but this, and I just thought, pray without season in all circumstances. Not in some, but in all circumstances. You see, prayer draws us closer to God in all circumstances. Prayer lets us see him more in all circumstances. I'm going to invite the worship team up right now. I'm going to finish here, but when we invite heaven on earth, our our aim and desire is not to get our prayers answered. Let, let me let, let, let that sink in. When we invite heaven on earth, your aim and my aim should not be to get an answer from God and have a miracle take place. Our aim and answer should be a desire for Jesus. Our aim and our answer should be a desire 
for Jesus, a closeness to him. What does Jesus say when the disciples said, why couldn't we cast this demon out? What does he say? He says, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. What he was saying here, in other words, is if you want to grow in your faith, draw closer to me. If you want to grow in your faith, draw closer to me. Jesus is literally inviting intimacy with him, a oneness with him. You see, the results don't matter. The answers don't matter when intimacy is the aim, when relationship is the aim. And the thing is, is that a lot of us, including myself, maybe you could swing this pendulum to think that either he heals or he can't be powerful. Either he moves or he's not God. You swing from belief to unbelief. But when you have intimacy with God, when you desire relationship with him, when you choose that your priority will be to know him, it doesn't go from right or wrong. It goes from he still heals and he is good. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He he is still powerful, but he is all-knowing. And right now, maybe you've been placing a bet with God to say, if you do this, then, I want to tell you, he still heals. He's still in the business of miracles. And he's still good. And he is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He can make the lame walk. He he can make the blind see. He can make the deaf hear. But He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. And He is ever-present in all circumstances, in all seasons. Would you bow your heads this morning? Would you close your eyes? I'd love to give people in this room the opportunity to to follow Jesus, to make a decision to believe in Him, to trust in Him, to place your life in His hands. It is the best decision you will ever make. And we've been talking about decisions. We've been talking about devotion to prayer. We've been talking about desire. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't end with desire. He started with desire because He desires relationship with you. And He decided to to devote Himself to making a way through His Son, Jesus, so that we could have a relationship with Him. He gave everything. He paid for our sins. He took our guilt and shame so that you and I could be saved and have eternal life. He rose again so that we could defeat death and have eternal life. So this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, do not let any doubt, unbelief or voices get in the way of this eternal decision. This morning, let no no distraction get in the way. But today, if you wanna make your life right with Jesus, Would you just lift your hand across this room and we're gonna pray this prayer together. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Anyone else in this room? Yep, I see that hand, I see that hand. Yep, I see that hand. Anyone else? some people in this room that are making this decision and sometimes you can make a decision and it's like, this is a life-changing moment. This is going to change your life forever. Across this room as one family, would you repeat this prayer after me? Lord, this day, I give you my life. Thank you for giving your life for me, for dying on the cross for my sin, rising again, so that I could live freely. 
today I receive your power and your grace. And I choose to follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together for the people that put their, gave their life to Jesus?